Hawking radiation is the only known way for black holes to lose mass. They leak away their otherwise forbidden interiors through quantum fluctuations. But for every black hole that we know of, it's completely irrelevant. In theory, Hawking radiation is super interesting, and we will get to that. However, in practice, it's a process that's so slow that for any actual black hole that we've discovered, it's completely irrelevant for basically anything. For example, consider the very first neutron star merger that we ever detected with gravitational waves, an event called GW170817. We don't actually know for certain whether the two neutron stars merged to form a black hole or a bigger neutron star, but let's assume they merged and collapsed to form a black hole. As far as I can tell, this would be the smallest mass black hole that we know of right now, with a mass of about 2.8 times the mass of our sun. It would be much smaller than our sun of course, with a radius equal in length to about the height of Mount Everest. How long do you think that it would take this, the smallest black hole yet discovered, to completely evaporate by Hawking radiation? You can assume that no matter's falling into the black hole and it isn't merging with anything else, so the mass can't grow in any way and it's only decreasing by Hawking radiation. Would you guess hours or, or days or maybe weeks? Maybe even years or centuries? If so, you're a long way off. How about millions of years or even billions of years? Surely that would be long enough to evaporate the smallest black hole. Still no. Even the current age of the universe, 13.7 billion years, is nowhere near enough for this black hole to disappear. The actual time it would take a 2.8 solar mass black hole to evaporate via Hawking radiation is one octodecillion, that's 10 to the power of 58, or a one with 58 zeros after it, times the age of the universe. Equivalently, it's this many years. This is a really long time, and it's why I say Hawking radiation is basically never a relevant effect when you think about real black holes. This timescale was also assuming that the black hole wasn't accreting anything at all, but in reality, even black holes with no matter falling into them are still absorbing photons from the cosmic microwave background, or CMB. And even this is enough to overcome any Hawking radiation, and means that every black hole we know of is actually growing all the time. Also remember that this was the time for the smallest black hole to evaporate. A supermassive black hole like Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, has a mass about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And this would take about 10 to the power of 77 times the age of the universe to evaporate, or this many years. Even a black hole in the range that LIGO can detect with gravitational waves, say 50 solar masses, it would take about 10 to the power of 66 times the age of the universe to evaporate. These are unfathomably long times, and everything in the universe will burn out and die long before any of these effects become important. So I've thrown a lot of really big numbers at you, but let's quickly cover what Hawking radiation actually is. If you haven't heard of this before and are now hearing me talk about black holes evaporating, you might be a little bit confused. Black holes are meant to be these eternal cosmic sinkholes that nothing can escape from, aren't they? Well, they are, until you consider quantum mechanics. I mean, an elephant couldn't escape from a black hole, but quantum fluctuations can. This was first shown by the great Stephen Hawking, who in 1974 explained how this could happen, and he did this in a paper with one of the coolest titles ever, Black Hole Explosions. Now, the full details of Hawking radiation are kind of complicated. They involve quantum field theory, negative frequency, vibrational modes of quantum fields, and all sorts of messy calculations. Luckily for us, Hawking himself offered us a simplified way of looking at it, and this has really become the most popular way of describing Hawking radiation. It's probably popular because we can all actually understand it, and although it does oversimplify the complexity of quantum mechanics a lot, I still think it provides us with enough intuition for what's happening to still be useful. Some people say that this is a too simplistic approach and it loses some of the key details and narrative of Hawking's original work. And to that I say, yeah, but that's okay. This is plenty of detail for most of us, and quantum modes going backwards in time or imaginary paths from the infinite past to the infinite future don't clear things up in the way some of you seem to think they do. However, if you do want to know these full details of the quantum calculation, I'll leave some links in the description to some really good videos that do try and explain all of that. Be warned though, they do contain a lot of quantum field theory and you might have to check your classical preconceptions at the door. 
For the rest of us, let's go down the path of describing Hawking radiation with virtual particles for now, and afterwards we can just review a couple of the caveats of this explanation, so we're all aware of the shortcomings of this way of thinking about it. The idea starts with quantum mechanics, and the fact that it's a probabilistic theory, and nothing is for certain. Take empty space. It's probably empty, but we never know that for certain. This is because, in quantum theories, the vacuum of empty space is really just fluctuating about a vacuum, like a ball rolling near a trough. We can picture it as a seething bath of so-called virtual particles popping into and out of existence. This is how lots of us like to visualise in our minds the uncertainty of how empty empty space is. We picture particle-antiparticle pairs of virtual particles being created and annihilated in the vacuum. They appear as a pair, exist briefly, and then recombine to destroy each other, as matter and antimatter always do when they touch. Don't take the virtual particles too seriously. They aren't real, and they don't really exist at the moment. They're just a tool we use in quantum mechanics to make the maths make sense. You can see that as long as the virtual particles do recombine and annihilate each other, that no matter is being created here, and the virtual particles just sort of borrow a bit of energy from the vacuum, and then they pay it back when they're destroyed. That's exactly what happens, most of the time. In flat space, or in all usual circumstances, everything is fine. However, around a black hole, the situation is not so simple, shall we say. Let's imagine one of these virtual pairs of particles appearing right next to the event horizon of a black hole. This event horizon marks the region from which nothing can escape, so if one of our virtual particles falls into this region, it is lost forever to the black hole, while its partner can't annihilate, and now we have a problem and a particle. This virtual particle suddenly can't be reabsorbed into the vacuum, and it has to become a real particle in the universe, and it looks sort of like it's been emitted from the black hole. In some way, it has been, because this particle has energy that seems to come from nowhere, and that can't happen. We can't create energy, so in order to compensate for our new particle, the black hole has to lose some energy, or mass, and donate it to the creation of our now real particle. This is Hawking radiation and it's how black holes should lose mass. This process can happen over and over again, and eventually, after a very long time, the black hole will shrink and probably evaporate to nothing. So this is quite a nice picture, but it is a simplified explanation, and it is important for us to remember some of the limitations of this picture. The first of these is that Hawking radiation isn't localized in the way that this setup makes it look. If you were to look right at the event horizon of a black hole, you wouldn't see particles coming from a particular spot on the horizon. Instead, Hawking radiation is a global effect, so we have to zoom out to see it, and it doesn't come from a specific spot on the black hole, but rather the radiation just comes from the sort of global area of the black hole. In fact, if you were falling through the event horizon, then you wouldn't see any radiation at all. It's a bath of radiation coming from a pretty large area around the black hole, not individual particles coming from given places on the event horizon. The other important thing to remember is that the particle-antiparticle picture makes it look like the black hole is emitting massive particles, like an electron or some other particle that has mass. But in reality, any black hole that we know of would exclusively emit photons. This is why we call it Hawking radiation and not Hawking's massive particles. Actually, black holes only emit photons that have a wavelength at least as large as the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole and often the wavelength is much, much larger than that. This can give us a little bit of intuition as to why black holes evaporate so slowly, and why it speeds up as the black hole shrinks. A photon that has a wavelength that's as long as the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole that has several solar masses will have incredibly low energy. These are extreme radio waves, and so when these photons drain energy from the black hole, it's only an absolutely tiny amount, resulting in the slowest evaporation imaginable. As the black hole eventually shrinks through this process, its radius will shrink, and so it can emit photons with slightly shorter wavelengths, corresponding to higher energy. This then drains a little bit more energy from the black hole each time, helping its shrinking to accelerate. This tells us that black holes Hawking radiate faster and faster as their mass and surface area decrease. As the energy of the emitted photons keeps increasing, it moves through the visible range for a time, so in theory we might be able to see this light with our eyes for some very small black holes. Eventually, the smallest black holes will be able to emit massive particles, because at some point the energy of the radiation is high enough to account for the rest mass of massive particles, thanks to our favourite equation, E equals mc squared. 
The fact that black holes emit higher and higher energy radiation as they evaporate means that we can associate a temperature to black holes. For large black holes, this temperature is incredibly low, but it increases as the black hole shrinks. And in the final moments of a black hole's life, they have very high temperatures. Since the tiniest black holes would evaporate so fast, we often say that they would evaporate explosively. But the truth is, we don't really know if that's true. Once a black hole gets small enough that it should be considered a quantum object, then we definitely need a theory of quantum gravity to describe it. This means that since we don't have one of those, we really don't know if a black hole will completely evaporate and disappear, or if at some point it stops evaporating and leaves us with some relic object in space. To be honest with you, we've never even seen actual Hawking radiation happen, so there might even be some quantum gravity effect that prevents it happening altogether. Anyway, I guess in this video I've been kind of dismissive about Hawking radiation, so let me end by thinking about the biggest black hole that could have evaporated via Hawking radiation through the history of our universe. This is hypothetical of course, because whatever this black hole is, it'll be much, much smaller than any black hole we've yet discovered. Let's assume this black hole formed immediately after the Big Bang, and it's been evaporating via Hawking radiation for the entire 13.7 billion years or so of the universe's history. Let's also assume that it's never eaten anything, not even CMB radiation. So Hawking evaporation is the only thing changing the black hole's mass, and that means it's always gonna be shrinking. How big do you think this black hole could be? if it's the biggest black hole to be able to completely disappear through Hawking radiation in the entire history of our universe. Let me know a guess in the comments below before I tell you. Do you think it could be the mass of a planet or a moon? Maybe bigger or maybe smaller? Well, the largest such black hole has a mass of 10 to the power of 14 grams. That's a one with 14 zeros after it. This sounds like quite a big number, but for black holes, it's insanely small. A black hole with this mass would have a radius about one-fifth the diameter of a proton. And that's the largest black hole that could have evaporated. Demonstrating, once again, how slow this process is. So, I'll end by saying it one more time. Hawking radiation is totally irrelevant for every black hole that we actually know of. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!